This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description. A practical prayer is a prayer that works. These discussions between Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence dive into the details of how it works and how to work it. Reverend Bill is a New Thought minister and the author of Practical Prayer for Real Results. Your new life begins with a new thought. Carol Lawrence is on a spiritual quest, finding the New Thought teaching after decades on the pulpit in three different traditional denominations. I've got some questions. Together, they're exploring the philosophy and activities that come together from many of the world's religions to create the practical spirituality that is New Thought. Welcome to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. So we're going to talk. You have a wonderful structure and concept that you wanted to talk about today. And on one side of it, you put three or four different words. On the other side, you put one. And it is allowing or Mm -hmm. surrender or submission. Mm -hmm. And on the other side is versus ego. And Mm -hmm. there is a lot of richness there. And the fact that I so rarely use the term submission every once in a while, but not very often. So talk more about the question. Well, submission is something that is a dirty word, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, good. It's not just me. (laughs) This is a dirty word for a lot of women with a more independent spirit. And the Bible talks about submission to husbands and blah, blah, blah. And I did deep dive, no surprise there, research on the word submission. And I came up with It doesn't mean what you think it does. Come on, let's talk about this. But nobody wants to talk about it because it has been such an ugly word. Wait, (laughs) you came up with what? I think I came up with a way to honor the word submission without feeling like you're bowing down. You know, okay, let me just do it this way. Because we talked about this during a pre-show. I said that my father, he was a businessman, so he really was committed to telling me how to function and win in the end and take a punch and, you know, do all this on the ropes and everything, come out okay. So he would say, take low, learn how to take low, lose this fight, because if you don't, you'll not get to the real one later. So I see that as being submissive or other people would think it as submissive, which to me, it really isn't. I'm just letting you have the moment because I'm going to win the hour. I'm going to take the day. I got so it. We're having a technical difficulty a little bit. Your audio is dropping in and out. I can't believe why this is happening. It's I just Mercury don't... retrograde. We're just not going to worry about it. Which I 100% agree with. It's been doing me badly for the last couple of days. <laughs> I mentioned it to my son. He says, oh yeah, so and so and so. And he just went on like, I said, why did you ever tell me about this? He said, well, nothing we can do till it's over. So that's it. Oh, and if somebody tries to tell you about Mercury retrograde during Mercury retrograde, the chances of you hearing it are relatively slim because Mercury retrograde. Yeah, but it made sense when you explained it. So I'm just like trying to go with it. You said something about October 2nd, or I saw it online that it's over around October 2nd, something like that. I said, okay, I'll hold my breath till then, back up, record everything, and hope for the best. (laughs) See what happens. (laughs) And hope that Bill knows what I'm saying while he can't hear the words. It's just the way it works. And that's part of allowing. There we go. Let's loop it right back in. Allowing and surrender. Submitting to the Mercury retrograde. And submission, to me, the reason that I don't use that is because it seems like there's a hierarchy. Allowing means that we are opening and we are in a position where we can let go of our own stuff. That's to surrender. Allowing is to be involved in the process. Whereas submission is like there's a process that knows more than we do that's better than we are. And it's going to beat us up until we do what is what we're told. And that's kind of the other side of the verses, which is the ego. Okay, so unravel that a little bit, because is there not God? You know, the God, whether you call is there God not spirit. God? Wait, 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 wait. Is there not God? That, don't ask yes. me. Yes. Okay. No, there, mean, isn't, there, is... there is not God. What are you doing it to me now in words? Sorry, sorry. Yes, there okay. is God. <laughs> there is God <laughs> of some kind. Whether you believe the God's out there, around here, wherever, internally, there is something greater. It's just not judging right? Correct. Or not correct. I agree with you. So is it fair to say that the God idea, whatever that is, has a better idea or has a higher understanding than we do? It has a bigger idea. It doesn't necessarily have a better idea. 
Because there's a big picture. There are times when we've been involved in something and from our perspective, it should go this way. And then later we learned that there was a lot more going on that we didn't know about. And in the bigger picture, oh, well, if I'd known the bigger picture, then I might have had a different, maybe not action, but at least a better attitude about the whole thing as it was coming together. And that's the same way when it comes to the infinite. We are a subset of the infinite. We're not less than it. We're just a piece of it. So mm -hmm. the fact that we're not aware of everything, that's where God is. And our ego tells us that we are aware of everything. So surrender is where we let go of the thought that we are all of it. And it's different than submission because submission is above us and allowing or surrender is around us. Mm -hmm. I Yeah, I agree with that. I think that it depends on the context that you're in. If you're always feeling like you're in a war, then submission has a different feel to it. So it's hard to always think about the person and what they're bringing to the table, you know, and who else is coming with them, what experience is coming with them and how they're interpreting what you're saying in the moment. So submission to me might mean something a whole lot different. But yeah, well, when you're talking about take low, you know, we were talking earlier, but take low is, you know, in a chess game, the objective is to capture the other player's king. And the pawns are not part of the end game. The pawns are the part at the beginning of the game where you're positioning yourself for what's going to come later. It's very rare that a pawn actually makes the winning move. And there are a lot of pawns that start out on the board that wind up getting taken out early on. Well, you can have some empathy for the pawns. They were born pawns, and they're going to get taken out in early rounds a lot. And that's the position there. That's the surrender. That's the allowing so that there's something bigger going on that can happen. Now, if we were individualized as a pawn and our ego told us that we were in charge of the world, that we were the king, then we'd be having very unhappy experiences as the king over there keeps on surviving long after we get taken out of the game. <laughs> you know, that's the allowing and the surrender is knowing that there's something bigger going on. It's not just about us. Yeah, I think it takes some practice and faith comes in there too. It's just so many things that come in there because right now I'm looking back on certain experiences, which we all do. If I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done da, da, da. But it seems like we never can really get the whole picture until we're past it, you know, until after we've done all the dumb stuff that we wouldn't do if we knew better. You're looking at, and I want to be smart from the beginning, you know, like, can I please just kind of have the information that I need not to do dumb stuff no. once in a while. <laughs> no, well, you, you do once in a while. You just don't every time. You know, you're falling into that perfectionist trap where you think that if you ever do it, you always do it and you are you should never do it. And that's all back to the difference between excellence and perfectionism. So you were telling a story before about how you got 100 in seminary and then they mark mm -hmm. you down five points for being a woman. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, you couldn't have done anything about that. You could have chosen a different seminary maybe which you now have, but that wasn't part of the program then. And you're not going to change anything. And you're not going to change from being a woman because that would take even more points off in that group. <laughs> yeah, well, lucky my comments didn't get me more points off because I, <laughs> I got a big graphic about that. I'm just imagining that conversation. That's fun in my head. You know, I will go along and I know a lot of people can relate. To, I'll go along with this. I'll make allowances for all of this stuff that you're throwing at me. But there's a line. And if you cross it, I'm going to stop you. And sometimes people are used to crossing the line and they're shocked. You know, when somebody says, whoa, don't piss in my face and tell me it's raining. So, <laughs> I love the and, visual of that. And, you know, they've been used to doing that. And then every now and then they meet somebody who says, uh, -uh this ain't happening. And they don't know what to do with it. Well, fix it. Don't do that. Just mm -hmm. don't do that. You know, respect yeah. people. And the first part is owning it. If that's what they're doing, then they need to say, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I'm doing. They know. Yeah, they know. And if they don't know, then telling somebody that's five points off for their birth gender, I mean, you know, that's a real stretch. Where is that written down in your grade book? You know, it's one of those things that people just go along with unspoken because it's always been that way. And if nobody says anything, it will continue. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not saying that it changed after me. I can tell you there was conversation about it after me. And it's up to the next person that comes along to continue to say, you're not doing this. But also, I felt like every battle isn't mine to do. And so I need this to get on to where I'm going. So you got this, but I want you to understand that I know that it's piss and not rain. <laughs> so. You brought up an excellent point, and it's actually a cornerstone of the New Thought teaching, which is the ability to look a fact in the face and know something better, to be able to deny that which has always been. And the big part for me is when somebody says, well, that's the way it's always been. The answer is, 
up until now. Up until now. Infinite universe, whatever happened up until now is simply precursor to this moment and anything is possible. Let's take a break and when we return, we will continue talking about this level of detail. Learn to put practical prayer to work in your life. The steps are simple to learn and let you begin to get real results to create the life of your dreams immediately. Reverend Bill Marcioni's widely acclaimed book, Practical Prayer for Real Results, gives you a clear summary of the new thought principles behind practical prayer and the series of easy-to-understand steps found in the most effective prayers from religions and spiritual practices all over the world and throughout history. Practical prayer is not a replacement for your religion or practice. It's a technique to make the work you do in consciousness even more effective. The book includes 40 prayers on various topics that you can adapt as needed and use as your own. Practical Prayer for Real Results is available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook on Amazon or at b-the-light.com. That's b-the-light.com. Welcome back to the Practical Prayer Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. Let's go. Let's go. go. (laughs) (laughs) That's the way it's always been. That was actually, even in the business world, even in in small business, when I was really young, I was in my teens and I was, you know, in my early 20s. And people say, well, that's the way we've always done it. It's like, well, that doesn't mean make it good. That just makes it easy or familiar or in some cases obsolete. I was at one point working at a graphics company. I was the consultant who was helping them to advance their desktop publishing operations. And this was back in the good old days when desktop publishing was relatively new and not everybody knew how to do it and it was not easy. And one of the women who was working for me started doing something on the computer and jumping through some hoops. It's a lot of work on a graphic that the client had supplied. I said, well, what are you doing? She says, oh, well, this is to get around X, Y, or Z limitation in the software. I think it was Adobe Illustrator. And I said, oh, Okay, yeah, I recognize what you're doing. The issue, the bug in the software that made you have to do that got fixed five years ago. (laughs) So the workaround that you're still doing that's taking an extra 40 minutes every page still works. You just don't have to do it. You can just click the button and it's going to get done automatically. Yeah, yeah. But if that's the way you've always done it, if there's not a reason to look at it and evaluate it and say, is this still what I want to be experiencing? Is this still what I want to be doing? Then we get to keep on doing it and we continue to get the same result. Mm -hmm. And then it's about not wanting to change because what's going to happen when things change? Will I still be able to function at the level that I am or be at that level that I am? I used to resent the idea that ego always came into the conversation. I really, really did because I always thought I had a fix on that. And I think I still do, but <laughs> 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 but it does come in the conversation much more than I thought, much, much more. Because a lot of times I think in saying that this is the way it's always been, that's the ego fighting to stay alive or in control. And, you know, it's, it just is amazing how important that is to some, to not oh, want yeah. to change. You know, it's important that things stay this way because what's going to happen to me? You know, and I'm thinking nothing, you know, we'll just learn something new. We'll do something better. It'll be different. We'll learn. You know, my line is, let's go, (laughs) let's go. Let's go. I mean, there used to be a huge problem in New York City. We grew up outside New York and I went to school at NYU. There were a couple of really huge problems in New York City. One of them was all the horse manure that was on the streets because of the horse-drawn wagons and carriages and whatnot. And another one was all of the soot that was all over the buildings from the coal that was being burned in furnaces all over the city. And... On the one hand, those problems got cleaned up. That was wonderful. But do you know how many people whose job it was to sweep up after horses got put out of work? The buggy whip manufacturing industry was decimated by those cars, those horseless carriages. And it's a reason for uproar and turmoil. And the same thing is going on now as we're looking at the energy that we've been using and the energy that we want to be using in the future. And you can look at that and say, what's going to happen to the coal workers, the coal miners and and the oil field workers and everybody in the energy business? And... If somebody was running a railroad 100, 150 years ago and they tried to stay in the railroad business, they might have been struggling. But if they realize they're in the transportation business and, oh, here are some airplanes that are coming along and we diversify into shipping and trucking and transportation business includes things like 
FedEx. So it's possible to actually do pretty well if you stay in the energy business or the transportation business instead of focusing in and saying, I'm in the railroad business. That's like, take a deep breath. You've got to be a little bit brave or have a lot of faith. For example, there's something that was real close to home or, you know, feet on the ground. I went to a restaurant a couple of weeks ago and there was no waitress. It was a robot. And the robot brought your food <laughs> and then somebody would come and put it on the table. But it was like, <laughs> it was lovely. It was an experience. But I noticed that it took the jobs away from a lot of people. And I wondered what was going on back in the kitchen, right? I said, if this robot knew where to stop, it said, thank you. It turned around, said, see you later. I mean, it did everything that a human did. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, okay, a lot of people are going to be upset because these robots are, listen, I just happened into this restaurant. They're probably all over the place and I didn't know it. So people that usually do those jobs have to figure out what's next and you don't have time to complain because the robots are on it. Mm -hmm. So is that saying, okay, I surrender. I have to allow this because this is what's happening. What do I do next? Well, here's a question that I have that you probably didn't think of, and you can probably answer it. Did you tip the robot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 we, we, we we did know, but we did the normal tip that, you know, because I figure somebody's back there working. They need to. It's only fair until I read something that says you don't. I didn't know. Yeah. And it's possible, you know, when the robot tips out the human staff, since the robot is already like completely got everything taken care of, that it's the human staff that gets all the tips, in which case what's happening is it's up leveling what's going on for the people who are working, who are still working in that particular restaurant. And if we focus in on, oh my God, there's a robot who took their job away, then you know, anytime we get more efficiency somewhere in a workplace or in, I mean, that's what productivity is about, how much we get done per person, per day, per hour, per week, per whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. And the more work gets done by an individual person, the higher our productivity is and the better off we are as a society. And the idea is to keep that number growing and growing and growing. Well, we're not going to do it by making somebody who used to work 40 hours a week do 40 hours worth of work you know, or 50 hours worth of work in 40 hours because they're only given 40 hours worth of pay and just more work and you're just going to stress them and stress them and stress them. We're going to find ways to make it more efficient. If you look at that in the opposite direction, if you weren't increasing productivity, then if you wanted to get more work done, you'd have to hire more people. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, well, those people are all missing out on employment opportunities. Okay, yes, and mm -hmm. there are a couple of ways of looking at that. Now, if somebody in 2022 would like to organize a union for the buggy whip makers, they're probably not going to get a lot of traction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's absolutely what's happening, and that sounds like a nice conversation, but it's real. It's actually happening, and you have to decide what are you going to do because you're not going to change it. We're never going back to the way things were. That is correct. The pandemic for me is just like a mark, you know, in time. I don't know how much was going on before that. This is just a mark in time. Never are things going to be the way they were, even before the pandemic. So we have to call on every bit of creativity we have, every bit mm -hmm. of faith we have, and see what we can do. And unfortunately, I mean, and also not take it personally, it isn't. It's not like they don't like to hire people. It's all about the bottom line. I get it. But this is affecting me. So how am I going to handle this? In my professional career, I actually was involved in making three or four different industries obsolete. I started out being a radio personality on an AM radio station. There's still some AM radio stations, but they're not doing high profile comedy morning shows at this point. They're playing gospel music or maybe running sports. And then after that, I went into the publishing industry. And the first company that I worked for doing that seriously was in the typesetting business. Remember back in the old days when they did typesetting? I used to have typography do. shops. They don't do that yes. anymore. So I was involved in moving from people who had a job as a typesetter to people who were using computers. And that was a, a small function. What they're doing was typesetting. So we put the typesetters out of business and there were production shops that would take the layout files that the artists at the ad agencies and the, the book publishers and things and turn those into the films that the printing companies could use. Well, I was involved in putting the trade companies out of work because now it goes straight from the ad agency to the printing company. And making that more and more and more efficient, there were whole departments at the printing companies that we did away with by making them go digital. And there are, of course, the two ways that you can look at that is what about all those poor people who are running printing presses or doing typesetting or these other things that they'd spent a lot of time learning how to do? What about those poor people? And the other way you can look at it is that's evolution. You know, mm -hmm. That's the way evolution works. There's not a whole lot of call for blacksmiths anymore to put shoes on horses. Some not like they used to be. 
Mm -hmm. And it's happening everywhere, I think, in every part of our lives. People are not going back to church the way they were. They're Mm -hmm. not going to do it. I don't care how cute you make it, because during the pandemic, there were options, and those options became comfortable. And people are giving Mm -hmm. it up. Plus, there's folks like you know, new thought voices out there <laughs> talking about, listen, here's an alternative way to look at it. Yep. And it's, you know, and that's real. You know, it's not a gimmick. It's real. And people are having an opportunity to look at things in a different way. Therefore, so what happens, these buildings are now white elephants, mega churches and so forth. Not all, but, you know, a lot of everybody's feeling it. I've asked myself, even in a lot of different ways where it has impacted my life, I don't have time to worry about it. It's not going back the way it was. Learn this new thing. Do the best you can. Stay up as long as you can and try to stay alert as you can. Read, try to figure it out or drop out. Those are your options, right? Yeah, the chicken is not going to go back into the egg. That opportunity, that moment in time has passed and there's something new that's here now. And I agree with you. I think that's one of the wonderful things that New Thought has is it's not anchored to things being a particular way, but it is more about the philosophy and the understanding about how things go from being the way they were to the way they are to the way they're on the way to being. Let's take another break and we are going to, when we return, we'll do a prayer. You know what the prayer is for? What? Oh, neither do I. <laughs> Get inspiration in an instant. God calls are the gentle and uplifting moment of truth to help you remember that the bright light of God's love is shining right now as you. It's your God call with Reverend Bill. Start your two-week free trial today and you'll get a phone call four times a week from Reverend Bill with an uplifting half-minute message filled with insight, wisdom, story, and fun. Let your light shine. You can answer the call to listen to it live or let it go to voicemail so you can hear it later. After the free trial, your subscription is just five ninety-five a month. The details are at godcall.org. God calls are disruptive, intentionally. Whenever you write something, put on a gold star. They take you away from your routine to remind you about the truth of who you really are. They come at random times between 8.15 a.m. and 6 p.m., so you won't be expecting them. And somehow, the message is exactly what you need to hear at the time. Magic is loose in the world. It's a moment of motivation in the middle of your day. Find out more and start your two-week free trial now. Welcome back to the Practical Parent Podcast. I'm Carol Lawrence here with Reverend Dr. Bill Marcioni. I got to say this, you know, we always take a break when the conversation is getting hot, right? (laughs) We want to make sure it doesn't overheat. (laughs) Last week, you know, we took a break and I'm like, what? (laughs) It was really getting good. So, okay, go ahead. Do we make the podcast be an hour long so we can like get really in the juicy meat of it? Or it would be even hotter at 60 minutes? It'd be hot, man. I think we got to. It'd be hot. Okay. Completely contrary to your position, we'll probably have to do a stage show. You and me together, bricks and mortar, big TV crew, and just talk for an hour and a half. Well, we could do it. You know, oh, but yeah. I can't do all that. Other. You know what? This Zoom thing and all that, this is crazy, wonderful. You know, I get tired of the background, I change it. Don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into the well, postseason. We'll do it down near the Jersey Shore so you don't have to drive far. Do it at the ocean. Let me tell you. Oh, see, okay. there you go. That's your real virtual background. That's the Atlantic it. behind you. I have so many pictures of it. I haven't been there in two weeks. That's why I'm off. But go ahead. I just sort of tongue in cheek. I said I had no idea what the prayer is going to be about. And in fact, the prayer today is going to be about new possibilities. And not just new possibilities, but highest and best possibilities unfolding for us. Because as I mentioned previously, there is this trajectory that we're on. We understand or we have a story about the past and what has led us up to this point. And we have a story and a perspective and our own claim on how things are now. And then we have an expectation that if things continue going along the arc that they've been going, then we and our egos being really smart can project where they're headed next. And that's the part that is subject to change. In fact, in some cases, I've like gone back and had a discussion with the people who I had an experience with. And it turns out that their experience was completely different than mine. And my assumption about what was going on or my impression about what was going on was not the same as it was for everybody else. So when I understood the bigger picture, it's like, oh, okay, I either didn't get it or I misunderstood or I overreacted or I some other way played a part in the drama that wasn't what I thought it was. So we actually get to change that part We can also change the part in the future because it doesn't have to go according to the linear trajectory that we have in mind.
mind, and it's possible that the place where we are right now is not the place where we think we are. For example, if there's somebody who's listening now who thinks that they're in a place of disempowerment, a place of less than, a place of not deserving whatever good it is that they're desiring, that's not true. That is simply not true. The experience might let us suspect that that's not true or believe that that's the case, but it's not true. There is no limit. Each person within the sound of my voice is a divine and perfect expression of God's infinite love. And with that as the prequel, I'm going to start the prayer, as I know that Carol loves when I say this is where we're going to start the prayer. This prayer is to know that the newest, freshest, highest, and best possibilities are unfolding for each and every one of us. And we know that because there is one, one infinite creative power, one divine presence, one love, one source. We call it God. We call it nature. We call it spirit. We call it the Big Bang. We give it many, many different names, but it is that one, that one which shares itself and expresses and reveals and unfolds and evolves itself into and as everything that we experience in this manifest universe. There is only that one showing up in lots and lots and lots of different ways. And those ways include me and each one within the sound of my voice. There is no inherent limitation in any of us. The divine nature that is the truth, the center and circumference of what we are, has no limitation. Any limitation that we perceive, believe, or have experienced is an external layer that's put on top of that truth of what we are. We are each individualizations of that divine love. And so good and more good and more good, in whatever way we describe it, is available to us right here and right now and in every moment and in every activity. That divine power and presence is within. The ability to claim and invite that infinite creative power to create something new for us is also within. So as each one of us is setting the intention for that next new experience of health and vitality, of prosperity, of love and connection and friendship and fellowship and alliance and fitting in, of creativity and expression and sharing in the world, of spiritual awareness and being involved in that ever deepening practice of spirituality, whatever that good looks like for each of us, that's what's unfolding for us now. And there's no power in the universe that can stop it. This is that bright light of God's love and it's shining through everything. When there's darkness, it's because something has obstructed or gotten in the way of the light. There is no amount of darkness that can overcome any amount of light. There's not a big bucket of darkness you can pour on even a candle and make the candle go out. That light is shining now. That love is unfolding now. That goodness is revealing itself now for each of us and for all of us. And it's already happening and it's continuing to happen and continues and unfolds and expresses and highest and best is at hand for each of us. And I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the wonderful way that it's unfolding. I'm grateful for the stories we get to tell about it. And I'm grateful to know that the law is already saying yes. So with a deep feeling of thanks, I speak this word, I release it into that creative law and know that it's already saying yes. And so it is. Practical Prayer Podcast with Reverend Bill Marcioni and Carol Lawrence is a production of BeTheLight.com. Be-the-light.com. Where you can find more information about practical prayer for real results. Our theme is by Music of Wisdom. You can learn about the spiritual community of New Thought Philadelphia with daily guided meditations, weekly celebrations of spirit, and Reverend Bill's classes in practical spirituality at NewThoughtPhilly.org. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. We're grateful for your tax-deductible donation at newthoughtphilly.org or the link in the episode description.